Um, hello everyone, my name is Bill Duane, and I look after the well-being learning programs here, which includes the uh, GPAWS program. And today's talk is about uh, everyday well-being and the way that mindfulness can, can be supportive of that, in particular um, during good times and, uh, and during challenging times, which is one of my favorite topics to hear uh, uh, Noah talk about. One of the things that's been really interesting in my practice has been the more I learn about uh, my own experience with well-being, even though the journey seems very unique and personal to me, the more I learn about that really deeply personal journey, the more I learn about how this connects to other people's and their own journeys. And so an important part of the GPAWS program is connecting what goes on here at Google, what's, what's going on in the rest of the world. And in particular, this really interesting and, and beautiful way that we, that we see the connection between our practice and other people's. Uh, and particularly um, you know, during a time of inequality, uh, it's really important to make sure that there's a connection between the privileged and the less privileged, particularly in terms of practice. So that's why, um, hopefully, how many people here are G-pausers? Yay. So do you guys know that when you practice and you record your practice, it goes to nonprofits that teach mindfulness uh, to less privileged groups? And I have the privilege of uh, talking about the Mind Body Awareness Project, uh, which is one of the groups that we give to. Um, you know, we all know what's going on in terms of incarceration rates and, uh, uh, and particularly with, uh, with kids. And again, going back to it, like what, what helps the kids in this situation is the same thing that helps us, sort of self-awareness, self-regulation, and compassion and empathy. Um, so there's this, there's this connection that's always going on. So even though today we're here to practice, you know, to talk about sort of our own well-being and everyday well-being, um, uh, it's, it's, it's in conjunction with the people who are doing this work, and we have a number of them here joining us to sort of let them know that they're supported um, both directly and indirectly uh, by this practice. And um, I'll be talking a little bit about the end, about some opportunities for volunteering uh, and donations. But um, for now, let me introduce my, my friend, my teacher, Noah Levine, author of books with words in them, <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on punk rock, well-being, meditation, compassion, um, you coming up with a young, young adult series? Recovery. Recovery, right? That's a great thing. So, um, as I mentioned, one of the, the things I appreciate most about him as a, as a teacher and as a person is the ability to skillfully blend practice with appreciation, but also sort of a, a, a low bullshit orientation towards challenges and this idea of turning towards challenge as opposed to um, turning away from it. So, with that, I uh, introduce to you Mr. Noah Levine. Thank you. I'm happy to be here and uh, especially happy to be here uh, for, you know, for this conversation with you, but actually, uh, you know, in support of the Mind Body Awareness Project. And uh, I'm not at all used, uh, although I speak quite a bit, I'm not used to standing up. I'm used to sitting down and uh, sitting on a meditation cushion most of the time when I'm teaching, or at least in a chair. But uh, so I'll stand here awkwardly and not really know what to do with my hands and <laughs> figure it out. Um, so a little background uh, of, of my experience that brought me to mindfulness practice and that eventually led to establishing the uh, nonprofit of Mind Body Awareness Project was that um, I, I probably was introduced to mindfulness as a, as a child. My father was actually a mindfulness meditation practitioner and teacher. And um, so it was modeled like I saw my parents meditating when I was a kid. And um, I, I was you know, somewhat aware of, of meditation. But um, through my own suffering in childhood and, and confusion and, um, and pain that I experienced, um, I, I completely rejected or just wasn't interested in. It was, it was modeled, although I just wasn't interested in uh, kind of anything healthy for me. I was interested in uh, destruction and uh, um, 
intoxication and, you know, I just I wanted to escape reality. I didn't want to sit mindfully in reality. I wanted to avoid it and found lots of different ways to avoid it and lots of um, experiences which eventually for me led to drug addiction and lots of crime and incarceration. And um, at 17 years old, sitting in Santa Cruz County Juvenile Hall where I grew up and I'd been in and out of this juvenile hall quite a bit from uh, I think I was about 11 years old the first time I got arrested and I just kept getting in trouble and you know in this sort of cycle of uh, recidivism and in and out of the court system in juvenile hall and um, and this moment of desperation in my life and uh, where there was a huge shift for me from uh, the first half, you know, the, that first portion and with all of that trouble and I just blamed everyone else. I didn't take any responsibility. I felt uh, maybe justified in my actions and somewhat like a victim, like I was a, uh, it was society's fault. <laughs> uh, it was my parents. I, I love to put it all on the hippies. It was the hippies fault <laughs> that I was an angry, violent, drug addicted punk rocker. I had to rebel against my parents and uh, but I found myself in um, sort of a desperation and and a, a realization uh, this last time that I was incarcerated um, where up until that time I had felt like uh, like I said like it was everybody else's fault and I felt really stuck and uh, my father had probably encouraged me to meditate a lot of times but I'd never really considered it. I'd never seriously considered it. But there was this moment where I had had a suicide attempt and I was in a padded room and an observation uh, cell and, um, and I got a phone call from my father and he, he didn't live locally. He was out of state and, and he said, uh, would you like some help? And I was like, yes, I need a lawyer. Totally get me some help. I'm in big trouble. <laughs> get me some help. And he said, um, uh, are you ready to learn mindfulness? Are you ready to practice meditation? And, uh, you know, with a little bit of disappointment, but with the desperation of, like, nothing else worked. Not, you know, nothing else that I've sought happiness or well-being or contentment through. Drugs, violence, crime, sex, attention. All of the, you know, kind of uh, adolescent ways that I thought would maybe make me happy. Um, None, it all failed, you know, because I was in this sort of like failure. So I was like, it's gotten this bad, I'll even try meditation. <laughs> I'm this desperate. <laughs> I will even try meditation. And um, right from the beginning of mindfulness practice, and I was given the simple mindfulness instructions that most people are given in the beginning, which is pay attention to your breath. I think something like breathing in, know that you're breathing in, feel the breath entering the nostrils. Breathing out, know that you're breathing out. Feel the sensations and ignore your mind for a moment and pay attention to your breath and your body. And um, that was a, a long time ago, a little over 27 years ago. I don't completely remember the conversation or, or my experience, um, but some way or another I got willing and I got inspired and I went back to my cell, my juvenile hall cell and started trying to meditate with this simple, actually, actually I think the other instruction that I was given was um, count, breathing in one, breathing out two, breathing in three, breathing out four. And I would kind of go one, two, and then be gone, just thinking about prison and what that was going to be like, or this sort of shame of the past and regret and, you know, just all of the suffering that my mind was creating, like being locked in a cell is unpleasant enough. Um, but Actually, my mind was worse. The past was way worse than being in that cell. The future was way worse. The, the, my fears, way worse. So I immediately got some, uh, some relief, some level of, of relief. Of um, What a relief to not be in my mind, even just for half a breath, even just for that in-breath, even just for that out-breath, just that little... 
uh, moment of avoiding the suffering, the psychological, mental, emotional suffering, and being with the, which was also a pretty unpleasant uh, experience for me at the time. I was detoxing from alcohol and drugs, and you know, it wasn't like all of a sudden I'm meditating peacefully in this jail cell. I'm uh, really unhappy. <laughs> but even my unhappiness, uh, that the mindfulness from the beginning I saw, this is better than what my mind creates the suffering that my mind creates. <laughs> my um, first couple of years, I ended up, I was locked up for a few months and then put into a group home. And I got very lucky. I, I, I could have, you know, it was the 80s. And they weren't sentencing uh, adolescents to, to adult prison yet. And the three strikes, all of that stuff, they weren't doing that for kids. And it was actually my third felony arrest that I was in for that time. And I, I could have, you know, kind of, that 20 years later, I could still, you know, kids that get arrested for the stuff that I got arrested end up for, you know, decades in prison. But uh, my, um, you know, the timing and fortunate, lucky karma, I don't know, some something, I ended up, uh, having a judge that said, let's just keep him in a group home until he turns 18, since I was still an adolescent. And I, I meditated. I tried to meditate. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I tried to pay attention to my breath and uh, tried to ignore my mind. But I was very embarrassed about it. I didn't, you know, meditation's not cool where I come from. <laughs> you know, like, I wasn't going to tell anybody that I was meditating. Uh, luckily, I was mostly in a single cell. And then I was put into this group home where there was like four teenagers in this room, you know, in kind of bunks. And, and then I'd have to kind of lay there and pretend like I was sleeping as I was doing sort of breath awareness or body scan or <laughs> kind of, I'm not, med I'm not being weird. I'm just laying here. And uh, kind of stealth, secret mindfulness practice. <laughs> And my meditation practice was pretty half-assed for the first couple of years. Um, I didn't get serious about meditation until I was about 19, and a late starter. Uh, first couple of years I did it, and I think I used mindfulness the way that um, <clears throat> a lot of people maybe use prayer or that uh, I've heard of the, I think they call it the foxhole prayer. When things get really bad, then you're bargaining with God, like, get me out of this one. I won't do it again. And I would use mindfulness like that when I got really stressed out, really afraid, really uh, shame spiral or something. I'd come back to my breath. Like, ignore that. Come back to my breath. Uh, and then I, at about 19 years old, I, um, I think that a piece for me, I don't know how, and I'll try to get into the core of the conversation here, but I still had this idea that maybe the happiness that I was seeking would come uh, somehow from outside of myself. I still had, and I was like, well, I'm a drug addict. If, like, if I'm sober, then I'll be happy. If I have money, if I have a relationship. Uh, I just kept thinking that like, somewhere out there was the happiness that I sought. And I found myself, just two years later, kind of, I went, got my GED, went back to college, had the car that I thought would make me happy. I wanted the low rider. I got it. I wanted the motorcycle, I got it. The beautiful girlfriend, I, you know, it's like, I had all of the material stuff and sensual experiences that I thought was gonna work. And I was so disappointed that it didn't work. That, um, I was so disappointed that I signed up for a meditation retreat. <laughs> Well, I also got busted by the police for graffiti. Sober vandalism out there, ego trip, tagging. And I got in all of this trouble, and it was meditation. It was like, oh, this is the only thing that's ever really worked. This is the only place I've ever found any true inner satisfaction or, or feelings of well-being. That the, the stuff, the sensual, the material, never really uh, satisfied me. And so I started going to meditation retreats and, and practicing daily and getting more disciplined about it and moving beyond um, the simple breath awareness, kind of ignoring my mind practice and was instructed in actually you know, expand to your whole body and expand to 
the emotions and feel them and uh, you know, start watching your mind rather than always ignoring it, being mindful of all of the experience of being rather than just using the breath as a, a stable uh, object that allows us to avoid uh, the thoughts. Although in the beginning, that's very important as all of you meditators know, but the instructions you know, expand. And not only the mindfulness practice, but also kind of the heart practices, the compassion practice and forgiveness meditation was a huge, important um, you know, foundation for me. I had so much self-hatred and so many resentments. And so training my mind in these forgive forgiveness phrases and compassion phrases and loving kindness and equanimity, all of these different uh, meditation techniques that I was introduced to, mindfulness being core for sure, um, but the emotional intelligence as well, and not just the not just the wisdom, not just the mindfulness wisdom. So I got very serious about meditation, and then um, it just made sense to me a few years into my own meditation practice to start going back in to the juvenile hall where I had been locked up and uh, really out of the gratitude of like, oh, this really worked. My life, not only externally, but really internally, my life changed so drastically and I felt so grateful. I finally came to a sense of, you know, kind of more sustainable, ongoing well-being, being comfortable in my own skin, being at ease, whether it was pleasant or unpleasant. And mindfulness taught me all of that. And uh, it all kind of went back to that moment of willingness in juvie that started my practice. And so, um, you know, sometime in the mid-90s, I started going back into the same juvenile hall. And um, actually, I, I'd imagine that many of you are familiar with the uh, Wisdom 2.0 conferences and Soren Gordhammer, who uh, has organized that, and Soren and I were friends, and uh, he, you know, we, we started the med juvenile hall meditation groups together, started going into Santa Cruz, and then we started going into San Mateo, and um, and teaching meditation to the to the kids. And I'd get in trouble once in a while because trying to relate to the uh, kids, I'd be like mindfulness. You know, it's like like you're rolling a joint. <laughs> like you're paying attention and you're like taking out the seeds and the stems and I try to use these sort of street analogies with the kids and sometimes the guards would be not so happy about that. <laughs> but the kids totally got it. They were like, yeah, I know what that's like when I'm really paying attention and I'm trying to get the seeds and the stems and I'm trying not to break the paper and that's the only time I'm really paying attention. So yeah, do that to your breath. Pay attention to your breath. It was a pretty wonderful experience, actually, going back into that, that um, same juvie and kind of full circle for me. And, um, and then a few years later, uh, when I was going grad school in San Francisco, some of the guys that were in graduate school with me knew that I was doing the meditation groups. And they said, hey, let's start a nonprofit and let's do this more. Let's do more meditation groups. Let's expand it to San Francisco and Marin and Oakland. And, we got a grant from uh, Thich Nhat Hanh that helped us start the uh, Oakland uh, meditation groups in the Oakland Alameda Juvie. So as an, I know, long introduction, but just uh, it's so wonderful for me because you know, then I became a psychotherapist and I began kind of being a full-time meditation teacher uh, and writing books about it and all of that. And, and I kind of turned uh, MBA over to the people that were still going in, and I kind of went on and opened a meditation center in New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles and, and kind of went, went this other kind of direction than doing, doing the juvie work, but always with a little bit of connection to it and staying in Board of Advisors. And then last year of really um, seeing that the um, organization was struggling, really struggling financially of saying, saying, how can I help? How can I help raise some money? How can I, I want this work to continue, make sure that kids in juvie get introduced to mindfulness. So it's such a joy to be here on their behalf. And now let me try to shift a little bit into the, the topic of everyday well, well-being and I mean, I guess the simplest uh, 
way to talk about it, and, and it's, a, it's a big shift for most of us, is to come through mindfulness, through present time, non-judgmental, investigative awareness, which would be one of the ways that I would define mindfulness. Present time, no judgment of what's happening in the present. Some level of investigation. I think that there can be a confusion often. We say mindfulness and we say, well, let's ignore our minds. And then we think, people think, oh, I can't use my mind then to investigate what's happening in the present because that's thinking, right? But that actually there's a quality of mindfulness that is reflecting on what's happening here and now of investigating and looking deeply and even thinking about what's going on. What is this emotion? What is this sensation? What is this thought of an inquiry and an investigation, the appropriate use of thought in meditation? Not just always ignoring our minds forever, uh, but using them, training them, maybe even turning the mind into an ally, the wisdom that gets developed and uncovered through mindfulness. And I, f I feel like the, um, what I wanted to say about that was that through this experience, beginning to understand directly and deeply that our happiness or unhappiness, our, our well-being, just like me sitting in that juvenile hall cell, it doesn't really depend on what's going on. Now, whether it's a really difficult experience that's happening. Or I've also had the experience when my first book came out and it was on the bestsellers list and I was so, you know, it was like so exciting. I wrote a book and it's on the bestsellers list. But I was in this relationship that wasn't going very well. And just seeing this sort of like, I'm supposed to be really happy. I'm kind of miserable. I'm kind of not, you know, I'm not getting my way. Uh, things aren't going as well as I thought or, or just that, uh, that disappointment. I thought I'd be happy. I thought that success and sobriety and would be the solution, and then always having to come back to uh, the inner well-being. And that it's not about what's happening, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, but that it's how, how, are, how am I, how are we relating to what's happening, whether it's really difficult or it's really uh, wonderful really good, really pleasant. That was uh, kind of a big example of that. Uh, and maybe some, I imagine some of you have had that experience. I, I was meeting with a music producer a few months ago who wanted to learn to mindfulness and asked me to talk to him. And uh, we were talking about his first platinum record. And he said, it was like the worst day of my life. Mm -hmm. It was like, I thought it would be the best day of my life. But for some reason, it just, it was just like crushing that it happened and it happened early in my career. And I just felt like uh, there's nowhere but down from here. <laughs> the bar has been raised and just what his mind did about his success. He went on to ask me a question. Uh, he has about half a billion dollars or something like that. And he went on to ask me a question. He said, some of my friends are really rich. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's, some of my friends are billionaires. And, you know, he's, I only have half a billion. So I'm not, you know, compared to them, I'm not that rich. Uh, and he said, and, and none of them are happy. He said, I have all these friends and they're billionaires. And we go on the yachts and we go and do this stuff. And... None of them are happy. And he was somebody who had realized that early that the money wasn't going to work for his happiness and turned towards meditation practice and uh, was saying, like, yes, I do that. And I make all this money. And I do music. And it's my passion. And, and I know that I have to take inner responsibility for my well-being and not the next success and not the next uh, platinum or whatever record. Uh, And that's the core, right? That's the simple and core teaching, which is that our, our, our well-being isn't about what's happening outside. And it's about how are we inside? Have we developed the, the compassion, the care for our own pain, for our own difficulties, for the stresses that we inevitably will face? And have we developed the um, like non-attached appreciation 
knowing mindfulness so quickly shows us, oh, everything's impermanent. Everything's constantly changing. But I want the good stuff to stay. <laughs> the clinging, the attachment, the, I want everything that's pleasant. Like, don't go, don't be impermanent. How dare you? <laughs> if it's unpleasant, please, yes, be impermanent. Uh, I'm happy to let go of this pain. But the pleasure, not so easy. The successes, the heights, the uh, good times, not so easy to let go of. Now, I have a sense that uh, I'm, a, I'm a poker player. I like poker analogies that the uh, kind of deck is stacked against us for happiness as human beings. That the survival instinct that we're born with, everyone, not just really messed up kids like me that become drug addicts and criminals, everyone. That we're born into this body that clings all by itself, that constantly craves for pleasure, that we all have a mind that's planning mind, planning, planning, comparing, judging, craving. That it's our survival instinct, that it's that reptilian part of the brain from the millions of years of, of evolution. Mindfulness is really a, this radical tool that not very many people have that teaches us about letting go and accepting the impermanent nature rather than clinging and craving and chasing the next fix, the next pleasure, the next success, the next promotion or whatever it is. Now that having been said, uh, also mindfulness gives us a way to Say, I, I, I do want the promotion, actually. I do want to be successful. I want to be healthy, maybe wealthy. What, you know, I, want, I do want all of that stuff. And how can I pursue my goals without suffering about it too much? How do I work for uh, satisfying the healthy desires that I have without the stress and fear and suffering? And mindfulness teaches us that directly. Uh, I think in the write-up, what Bill and I were going back and forth, he's like, he's like, it's a little vanilla. He's like, let's make it a little bit edgier, whether the shit hits the fan, <laughs> or what was it, or whether, whether you feel like you're kicking ass in life, or life is kicking your ass. And that with mindfulness, sometimes life does kick our ass. And can we maintain some level of well-being, even in the difficult times? And my experience with decades of mindfulness practice is that I'm fairly successful most of the time, even when it's really difficult. And I do have some difficulties. And that when life is really good, and uh, the inflation, the ego wants to take it all personal, that mindfulness says, oh, this isn't so personal, just pleasant attention. Don't believe those ego thoughts. Don't believe the stories that the mind wants to make up about it. No, it's just going to keep getting better from here. I'm kind of staying grounded in all things will pass. All things will change. So maybe let's see what kind of uh, questions, dialogue. I'm happy to talk with you about anything you'd like. Um, any questions about mindfulness, uh, other meditation techniques, uh, anything that I've said, any questions about MBA. We're going to talk about that a little bit at the end. But for your meditative practice, for your mindfulness, or compassion, or forgiveness, whatever it is that you're working on or getting inspired to work on in your own uh, efforts, what kind of thoughts, questions, or comments do you have? Please. Uh, my name is Genevieve. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, my question is around like transpersonal experiences, like really elevated like experiences of consciousness. Did that play in your meditative journey? And where do you sort of place those? Both on drugs and not on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you have to repeat that. 
<laughs> Did I need to repeat the qu the question? Was about um, she said transpersonal, elevated, expanded senses of consciousness, and um, did those play in my journey? And maybe is there a, how important are those experiences? Maybe. Well, uh, and I don't know if that's really your question, but that's the part that I'm interested in answering. <laughs> and I'll try to answer the first part, which is, um, you know, it seems like in the meditative uh, process, there are um, many different ways that, that it happens. There are some people who have these very big, expanded kind of awakenings and insights, and, and it's uh, kind of life-changing uh, experiences that happen through meditation. Really seeing some stuff you didn't see before and understanding your mind in a way, the, the, the ego, the self, whatever we call it, like there are some big transpersonal experiences that happen for some people. And there are other people that will meditate every day for decades and never have any of those big bright light bells and whistles meditative phenomena. And so there's a, a conversation in, in the meditation circles and community about um, kind of the spontaneous insights and or the gradual awakening process that happens of becoming more and more clear, more and more present. But it happens slowly, and it's no big uh, uh, experiences. It's just, oh, I actually pay attention more consistently, and I am compassionate more consistently, and I'm forgiving more easily, and I've become generous. And it's just sort of like happens very gradually rather than a big, uh, expansive experience that led to it. Um, I tend to see my own meditation practice developing pretty gradually. For instance, I would do some of the, um, what, what I'd call heart practices, loving kindness or compassion. And I'd like for the first couple of years that I would do those kind of practices, I didn't even mean it at all. <laughs> like I would say to myself, may I be happy, may I be kind. And there, my, there, my inner voice was so unkind, it was just like, this is bullshit. <laughs> But I kept doing it anyways. Like I just, I persevered. I had found in mindfulness enough relief that I wanted to really follow a meditative path in my life. Even though some of those other practices just felt like, this is just making me more agitated. This isn't making me calm at all. This is just showing me how angry and, and afraid I am. But, gra but then after a couple of years of sort of looking back and saying, oh, I actually mean it now. And after five years of like, oh, I actually mean it and feel it. How did this happen? I'm not you know, judging my own inner meditation voice so much anymore. And at ten, you know, 10 years in, of just really gradually looking back how it worked slowly. Um, and then I also have uh, done some really long meditation retreats, like three month silent meditation retreats. And and on those in one month and three months and lots of 10-day meditation retreats. And on those, sometimes I got so concentrated that I had some of those like really weird, expansive, might be what we call transpersonal uh, disillusion of everything. And uh, pretty weird meditative phenomena can happen when you're practicing all day, every day for weeks or months on end. But my teachers were always very, like, uh, a little bit dismissive of the, that phenomena. They were a little bit kind of like, oh, yeah, that's OK. Yeah, you dissolved into rainbows, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you know, like, you know, they, they would really just be like, you know, oh, can you pay attention to that? Can you note that? Is, that uh, is it pleasant or unpleasant? Are you clinging to it? Rather than putting much emphasis on those big, uh, meditation phenomena, just like just phenomena. Pay attention to it like you pay attention to the breath or the emotions or the mind. You don't have to push it away, but don't get attached to it. Don't think that that's like the real thing. It's just part of what happens. And uh, a lot of people have suffered a lot about, and maybe even some of you, and I know I've done it some, about like you start meditating, you have like a pleasant experience back in 1974. It's like, that was so good. And then you spend the rest of your meditation practice trying to get back there. I want that one again. I felt good once. And I want to do it. Oh, you know, and then you kind of suffer about 
trying to create an experience rather than what the core of mindfulness is, which is accepting what is, as it is, pleasant or unpleasant, expanded or contracted. One of my meditation teachers likes to uh, over and over say, right now, it's like this. And that that's the mantra. That's the whatever. You know, it's like this. And it's fun or it's painful. It's like this. It's joy. It's sorrow. It's boredom. It's like this. That radical acceptance perspective. Was that close enough to what you were? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, li I liked uh, you know, your comment about speaking uh, the uh, language of the people that you're teaching to, that you're talking to, and how important that is. And um, you know, like, I, I like teaching with Bill in this kind of environment, and we've done some, some things together, because he knows the language of, of Google and how, you know, and I, would, I could like, try to do some computer analogy that I would just botch. Like, I just, I don't, you know. <laughs> Uh, but that's, it's important. I think that Google has actually been great at doing that and empowering people from within to do the G pause and, you know, that, so that you're speaking to each other in, in your language rather than bringing all outside uh, facilitators. And, um, and for the, the latter part, uh, I feel like actually I'd like maybe Micah to um, speak to that question because he's like one of the core facilitators who's doing it now. And I feel like, actually, if I went into the juvie now, I'd be a little bit out of touch with the youth. You know, I was, when I was doing it 15 years ago, I felt like I was much more connected. Um, but now I'd feel a little bit less. I mean, I, I, I would do it, and I'd try, and I'd, there's a universal language. But I'd be curious, what would you say to that, uh, of kind of the entry point of uh, kind of what's working best, and what techniques are you, are you using that are, yeah? Yeah. Mike is um, one of the core instructors and does a lot of the classes around uh, the Bay. So, yeah, welcome. Uh, my name is Micah Anderson. Yeah, I'm the senior meditation instructor at MBA. And um, we have a 10, 10 to 12 module curriculum that we use with the youth. Um, the first kind of foundational one is introduction to mindfulness. Um, so, for example, the way we would kind of introduce that to the youth would be through a game called Still Chillin', which is um, essentially it's a competition to kind of see who can sit still the longest. Um, you know, and generally like a class would be eight to 10 kids, um, somewhere around there. Um, and, and slowly like we will play like five or six rounds sometimes and we'll uh, slowly we'll start to kind of introduce some, uh, some instruction in the actual game. Um, and it really, it, it's a great way for them to kind of start to find just focus. Usually it's a visual, right? They'll, they'll find a piece and they'll just kind of sit and just focus on it, right? And then uh, slowly people will start laughing and get knocked out. And there's always like last man standing kind of thing, you know? Um, and then as the, as the curriculum moves forward, and a lot of times we have a cohort model, which, uh, you know, we'll move through in each, each uh, module builds on the next one. So we'll talk about basic goodness. And then the next module would go into impulse regulation, just kind of unpacking how mindfulness can support um, impulses and reactivity, right? And the difference between a reaction and a response. Um, and then it, it really starts to go deeper. We'll, we'll, we do start to kind of go into things like emotional intelligence and awareness and how we can use that self uh, moment to moment presence to, uh, to kind of look at emotions and then eventually look at some difficult emotions and, and, and trauma and we'll unpack what empathy is and compassion and um, try and unearth beliefs about that the youth may have about themselves, whether negative or positive, and, and trying to kind of address those if, if possible. So those would be some of the areas. And we, we, we use uh, metta, loving kindness meditations. We use a variety of different, different types of body-based um, meditations, mindfulness of breath. Of course, the counting one is very good, you know, because the youth are, 
They're dealing with things like they can't fall asleep at night, and, and they're stressed about their court case in the morning, and they're separated from loved ones and, and their, their communities. And, and there's, there's a, you know, the majority of the youth that we're serving in, in San Mateo and as well as Alameda, they're, they're carrying a reasonable amount of trauma and PTSD that really is, is affecting their ability to, to do a lot, to do anything, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a certain way. So does that kind of help yeah. answer the question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So the question was, um, you know, the part of, of what will happen for people in meditation is that there will be different levels of, of pleasant experiences that Mangrit is uh, pointing to, of um, kind of joy will start to arise in the meditation, uh, uplifting joy he was talking about, or this kind of calming happiness and gladness that will happen and. Um, and then what's the connection between that and emotional pain? Um, and I don't know that I know the answer. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I know the answer to that. Uh, I have uh, directly experienced a, you know, a lot of really pleasant meditative states and you know, what we call the rapture states. And especially on those long retreats when you get really concentrated and all of the stuff starts to go away and this joy and happiness and comes. And of course, it's all impermanent, right? It comes and it goes, it, it passes. Um, I don't know the answer to how it's connected to emotional pain because I also, I've had so much emotional pain in my experience. And I think, you know, that I tend to think that, uh, you know, emotional pain is unavoidable for all of us human beings, that it's just part of having a mind, having a heart, having emotions, that, that we have unpleasant, afflictive, uh, emotional pain. And some, some, you know, some people have the deep uh, kind of traumatic experience that Micah was talking about with many of the uh, students that we're working with in the juvies. Um, maybe some of us, I know myself, have had a lot of traumatic experience in my life and a lot of emotional pain. But I don't know how, how or if it equates to the development. I tend to think of uh, the phenomena of joy, rapture, uh, that that is a universal outcome of training the mind. That in a deep meditative discipline, and you get concentrated enough, it's just what happens. Joy will arise. Gra gla gratitude, gladness, these kind of uh, pleasure states will happen. Um, and I would imagine that uh, whether or not you've had a lot, uh, kind of an extra dosage of emotional pain, uh, or actually you've had a life that hasn't had, you know, you've had the normal human suffering <laughs> that we all have. But it hasn't been extreme in any way that I, I, I'd imagine that they're, that I feel like, I don't know if that's true or not, but I feel like those are just sort of universal uh, qualities that happen as part of the phenomena of deep meditative discipline. Yeah. Can I, can I hold on that? Yeah, please. And I, I'd be curious what you, yeah, I think you have a thought about that that I haven't thought about, <laughs> Jen. <laughs> In, in your, in your uh, journey, which is a very touching journey of, of managing pain, your emotional pain, at what point did, did your ability to, de I, I'm guessing at some point you developed the ability to access joy. Yeah. And at what point did that become helpful as, as, a, as part of the journey towards overcoming pain? And, how, and if so, how so? It's hard for me to answer because, like I was saying in that first question, it happened so gradually for me. There wasn't, I can't point to like, oh, and then there was this moment. But I do kind of reflecting back and say like, oh, those first couple of years I was doing the, I wanted the kindness or the compassion or the joy and the appreciative joy, but it wasn't really happening. And I wasn't even able to, in my own inner voice, be sincere about what these well-wishing practices. Um, but that at a couple years started to shift. At, Five years, I can you know into my practice, I could see it, it really starting to shift. I can remember about ten years into my uh, meditation practice, where I had the f experience for the first time in my life 
uh, of forgiving everyone. Up to that point, I had resentments that I was trying to let go of, but hadn't let go of. And then I, you know, I had made some progress, 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 but there was still those couple that were just, no, not yet. <laughs> And then coming to this moment about 10 years into meditation practice where I had forgiven everyone, including myself, and I could think of even the worst people in the world, I could think of them with some compassion, with some forgiveness, and seeing them as suffering, confused beings. And that was joyous. And I can remember that. But I can also, uh, it was an interesting experience for me because there was also a delusion of permanence. I thought, I'm done. <laughs> Forgiveness did it. <laughs> totally done. And then I was a little bit surprised, you know, the next day when I was pissed off again. So I thought I was done with these resentments. I thought I'd forgiven. And then seeing like, oh, even that forgiveness, even that joyous experience of liberation from hatred was temporary. It was real, but it was really impermanent like every other mind state or emotion. So, you know, for me, pretty gradual. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell also inside of ourselves. Other people might be able to... Uh, Micah might be, you know, me and Micah have been friends for, you know, 25 years. Like, he might be able to say, like, yeah, you know, around seven years, he was less of a jerk. <laughs> he was happier or whatever, you know? Like, uh, you know, sometimes the people outside of us can say, you're happier. And inside, we're not always totally clear about when that happened. Um, how do we navigate the, the balance between generosity and kindness and compassion and forgiveness and healthy boundaries? And when it's uh, too much overtaxing on us or um, I think you ended with like, then we're resentful, like we've been too forgiving and we're not taking care of ourselves or too generous and not, uh, not taking care of ourselves. Um, it's a wonderful question. It's a very important question. And like a lot of these really deep and important personal questions for us, like there's absolutely a line of what's too much. When are we being complacent rather than active? When are we becoming a doormat uh, because I'm being compassionate towards your suffering, so I'm going to let you be unkind to me, and I'm going to be compassionate and forgiving? There's absolutely a line of you know, when we need to actually speak up for ourselves and say no and have a good boundary. And, uh, but I don't know where that line is for anybody else. Because it's for each one of us. It's our personal, where's the balance here for me? And so it's a lot of what the mindfulness practice and all of you know, this conversation is about, is developing that intuitive knowing of what's too much. and. And I think we get there um, from trial and error. I think the only way that we found our balance, our the middle, is through uh, giving too much, <laughs> giving not enough, forgiving, you know, in a, you know, having compassion in a way that's attached. You know, that kind of, I had compassion, I expected you to change. <laughs> not having the good boundaries. Uh, we, I think my own experience is that just the trial and error of like, oh, that didn't work so well. Let me try something different. It's always this ongoing experiment of finding balance. So uh, thank you so much. I'm really happy to have been here to share with you and to represent for MBA. And so a few minutes here at the end, um, Bill and I think Roger are going to have a few things to say. So some exciting news. So first of all, thank you, Noah. Um, so I have some exciting happy news. Um, so one is that, um, as you know, GPOS has uh, given a nice chunk of change to help MBA with its programs. Um, in addition, there is the Google Match. And uh, Meng and I are also going to have another match on top of that. So if anybody would like to go MBA project, you can do the Google Match and then send me an email. And then Meng and I will also match it up to $5,000 total. So it's a real nice opportunity. and. 
Um, I think doing is really important. That's why more and more of the GPAWS stuff is about volunteering and being in the community. Um, so there's also a really fun uh, project that we've just posted on GGIVE um, for a six-month design project to help them um, uh, increase their online and social network presence. So super fun there. So um, I'll send out an email with this information. Um, but it's the opportunity to really take some of the practices and connection that we were talking about uh, and sort of make it happen. So uh, that's an opportunity. So I'm Roger Miller. I'm the executive director of the Mind Body Awareness Project. And um, just really want to extend a lot of uh, appreciation and gratitude to Noah and also Bill for hosting us here. And certainly also uh, you, Meng, for your support. Um, and also just the general um, Google and GPAWS community. You, um, you all have been fantastic, whether or not you know it or not. Um, and, uh, and we would love to get more involved with Google. Uh, you're, this is such an amazing giving and growing community. We We'd, we would love to be more engaged. And, and we're really working a lot on trying to improve some of the digital products that we're pushing into the juvenile halls. Um, some recordings of guided meditations in the, in the language that the, the young people speak to help them sleep better, et cetera, at night. Um, and then also bringing that out into the community to the youth as they're trying to transition back into the world and leaving the safe or not so safe cocoon of the, uh, of the juvenile hall and returning to um, their communities. We want to be with them with some portable digital products and an app. And so that's some of what we're working on trying to develop. I put some flyers in the back. I opened this um, drug and alcohol treatment center in Los Angeles, a residential that's using meditation as the core treatment for addiction. So if you or anything you anybody you know might be interested in that, there's a some friend. flyers. You are a friend, <laughs> yes. Uh, I put some flyers back there. If you have any questions about it, happy to talk to you. Cool. About. There's also some MBA swag back there. Um, yeah. Oh, and if you do donate, there's a thing on GGIVE where you can say, please share my information with the group. If you do that, they will send you nice things like... Oh, prizes, t-shirts, t-shirt, swag. Water. We all love swag, <laughs> stuff like that. So, uh, so a reminder for that. And I suppose also be on the lookout for still chilling G pause sessions. I don't know, sounds pretty <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you all very much.